is the, the contract that a woman will draw up for her um, her wedding and even then she has the right to retain her own identity she doesn't have to take the name of her husband if she doesn't want to and so there were lots of um, sort of wow factors that I was reading I mean when you think about it less than 50 years ago in America a black woman could not sit next to a white man on a bus in, in the days of segregation and that is less than 50 years ago and yet 1400 years ago uh, the Quran made it clear that uh, Islam transcends nationality, skin color, cultures and in fact um, <coughs> the Prophet peace be upon him his last sermon um, you know he makes it perfectly clear that we are all equal and if we are to be judged differently in different levels it's on our level of piety and observance as Muslims if you if this is how you look at um, Quran treating men and women equally how would you make sense of the Muslim feminist and proponents like um, in Pakistan and in India like women like Asma Jahangi for instance in Pakistan is strong opponents and strong critics of the religious establishment or of Islam occasionally in Morocco, in India, in Pakistan, in Turkey. How would you make sense of that? Well, I am a feminist. I am a great supporter of women's rights. And I, th I believe that what women in the 70s in Britain and America and across Europe were striving for, this equality, was already available to Muslim women 1400 years ago. And there will be people who sit and listen to me saying, oh, she's a feminist, she's a modernizer. The beauty of Islam is that it has not changed, the, the Quran has not changed, 1400 years has not changed. And that is its strength. It doesn't need to change. It's as relevant today as it was 1400 years ago. And what I would say to Muslims across the world is what makes us what makes you so sure about that that it hasn't changed because this is something that I have specifically looked into I studied Islam for 30 months before I uh, reverted and one of the things that interested me were the origins and and how the Quran came into being and how it was delivered over a 23 year period and finally compiled. In fact, when it was compiled into a book form, the first keeper of the Quran was a woman. It was entrusted to a sister, this precious gift. And I, I've, I've looked into the historical background because after I read the Quran, I then went back to the Bible. <coughs> And then I discovered that the New Testament wasn't written until 70 years after the emergence of Jesus. Now then, we know as journalists that um, we can't get our facts right 24 hours after an event. So how could someone be, something be so accurate 70 years down the line? And I realized this is why the synoptic gospels in the Bible contradict each other. And although the Bible is a beautiful book, um, it's a compendium of wonderful stories, it's not accurate, it's not factual. But the Quran, you could look at a Quran of a printing press today and compare it to the first available Quran, and you will see that there is no but, difference. But and this is the Quran, strength. Quran was also not... Quran Karim was also not written down uh, during the days of the Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him right it was compiled in the first in the first in the first caliph's time period it was most compiled people remembered over it. A most people remembered it they remembered it by heart as prophet mm -hmm. said they remembered it so it was mm -hmm. basically what they call in urdu is sina dar sina basically they they knew it 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 was compiled over a 23 year period but it's like the hadith the hadith or um, have been compiled in an extremely scientific <coughs> way that uh, that there is corroboration, uh, matching statements, independence of corroboration, and, and it's it, the the accuracy at which these scholars strived to attain 
um, from the Hadith is absolutely amazing. And as I say, what I would um, say to uh, feminists is, yes, you know, we have a right. It is our right to be treated equally. Um, but don't modernize. Islam does not need to modernize. And I would say... Well, what do you mean by that? Well, there are people who interpret it, s some things in some ways and say should, uh, it, it needs to be updated, it needs to be modernized. Ershad Manji, the Canadian author of The Trouble with Islam, um, she's a lesbian and she's saying that uh, you know some of the Sharia needs to be changed to... Uh, try and keep up with um, the, the new century and I say no, you know, the Quran is a perfect code of uh, life, a perfect code of living and it doesn't need to change, it doesn't need to be updated and I would say to Muslims beware of the modernizers within because they will try and dilute our great faith and what you'll end up with is a hybrid like you have in Christianity. Look at the mess that the Christians are in. The Christian church is fractured, it's divided. They have gay clerics, uh, gay bishops. So one part of the church is split from the other. Uh, other sections of the church are trying to introduce um, female bishops, female church leaders. And they're trying to introduce and reinvent things that, uh, that simply were not there. And they're doing this to try and popularize the faith, to try and bring people in. And it isn't going to work. Ivan, <coughs> um, Ishad Manji is not exactly an intellectual, right? Those who have read her books, there are serious gaps in her scholarship. Mm -hmm. but what well, she isn't a scholar. She's not a scholar. You know, she's right. a lesbian with a chip on her shoulder but who wants I've, to take a yes. dig at Islam. So, She's not a scholar, but people who have her lifestyle, uh, where should Islam place them? I mean, she is like that. Now we come to believe people are born like that. So what should we do with them? Well, I am not here to uh, be that judgmental. You know, when the day of judgment comes, I won't be answering for Urshad Manji or people like her. I will be answering for me and accounting for me. And this is the other thing with, uh, with Islam, that it gives you a responsibility to account for your own behavior and your own actions. And it doesn't matter how good or bad your family is or the people around you or your friends. Uh, you can be surrounded by the most pious people, but it is not going to give you a ticket to paradise. It is, you know, it is your behavior, your uh, attitude um, in this life which will dictate what happens to you in the next life. Just a few moments before you said you went back, when you read Quran, you went back and read Bible once again. Were you ever a practicing Christian? Yes, yes I was. And I uh, was brought up in Sunday school, um, the Christian version of the madrasa. I was a Sunday school teacher. I sang in the choir. I was quite an active part of the church community. When I moved to London, I joined a very famous church, St. James's in Piccadilly. I probably went to church twice a month, which in some people's eyes in secular Britain is bordering on fanaticism. And so I was, I was quite, quite active. I've always believed in the one God. And uh, my belief in God was reinforced when I was reading the Quran. I happen to think Christianity is a great springboard to Islam and that's probably why it took me maybe 30 months of reading going back what exactly and forward. do you mean say Christianity being a great springboard to Islam this is a very secular way of looking at religion isn't it no you've got the same uh, prophets the same 